Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Braden Knudsen. I'll be your host for this webinar. We thank you for joining us today. Um, we'd like to ask you to answer a couple of our polls that we have down at the bottom as we go through our announcements for today. Our next webinar will be on Thursday, April 13th at 5.30 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Um, and that webinar will be on Researching in a Library or, or Archive by James Tanner. Um, it'll be a good one, so we hope you can come back and, uh, and join us then. Also, if you have any suggestions for future webinar topics, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu, um, and we'll, we'll try to incorporate as many topics as we can. Those are always appreciated. So today we'll be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled, How You Can Help with Record Preservation. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 35 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. So as we get this loaded up, remind you that we do have a comments box and a questions box on the right-hand side. Um, any questions will be answered by the end of the presentation. We will turn the time over to James now. Howdy, this is James Tanner, back for another webinar for the Brigham Young University Family History Library here on the beautiful campus of the University in Provo, Utah. And we're going to talk today about how you can help with record preservation and remind you that all of these webinars are recorded and uploaded to our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And they are free and you can watch them uh, anytime you want, as long as you have a connection to the internet, obviously. Okay, so we're going to talk about record preservation from a very personal standpoint here. First of all, we have to understand that record loss is constant and pervasive. What that means is that uh, around the world, uh, there are valuable genealogical records that are basically being destroyed as we speak, um, through war, through floods, through fires, through uh, just deterioration, through whatever happens to, to various records. And uh, as, it, as genealogists, we feel this is kind of a personal affront because we uh, feel like we have some kinds of uh, interest in uh, rights in, in, in looking at records and finding out about our ancestors and the things that we, that we do as genealogists. But we constantly run into this problem of having those particular records be uh, inaccessible or impossible to, uh, to, to access because of various reasons that we've talked about. Now, um, understanding that these losses are both accidental and intentional. Um, being an attorney, I'm painfully aware of various time uh, limits on uh, retention of documents in the United States. This is one example of what happens. And, and uh, for example, in a law office, uh, under the rules of uh, the uh, Bar Association and others in the su state Supreme Court in uh, Arizona, uh, attorneys were required to retain their records for seven years. After seven years, you dump them in the trash. Um, uh, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, many of the attorneys uh, didn't bother to get rid of any of their records forever, and so they had huge piles of records sitting around, and when they retired or when they uh, died, then all those records were destroyed. So it's, you know, this is something that uh, is a process. Most of the government agencies around the world have these sunset laws, sunset or record retention laws, that say that the records will be destroyed after a certain number of years. And so we're kind of fighting, uh, an up, uh, fighting upstream here. We're trying to go against the current of the way that the world is in, in uh, cleansing, cleansing itself of uh, old records. 
Um, the reason why, of course, that we are concerned is that these many of these records that are destroyed, uh, either through accident or intention, are are very valuable to us. So we need to be aware of what is happening in this situation. And it's obvious that we're dependent on our records. Um, there are, uh, I'm venturing to say that every single one of your family lines, or my family lines, comes to a point at which there are no more records. Um, uh, unless you want to make the stuff up, and I have another video on why you can't trace your genealogy back to Adam, but that's, that's a whole different issue. In reality, is is that we hit these holes in the records that prevent us uh, from from making any more progress in finding certain lines. Uh, we're always disappointed, of course, when we get in and to look for a roll of microfilm, or we get online to a database, and we find out that the year where we're looking happens to be missing from that particular record set. So these are are things that that occur to us on a constant basis, and we need to be aware of that situation. And from that standpoint, res record preservation has uh, many different aspects. There's a lot of different things we have to be concerned with. First of all, we have to identify the records. Those are records, which are the records that are uh, genealogically uh, interesting, uh, important, uh, worth preserving, and understand that uh, when we're talking about this process, that there is a built-in cost it's a cost in time, human labor, and a cost to uh, governments and any other record repository to store or preserve or whatever the records that are available. So we're always on somebody's payroll as far as determining whether or not uh, records are going to be kept. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've had some situations in some of the states in the United States, such as Georgia, for example, was one example where uh, funding for the state uh, archives, so the state library has uh, evaporated. Uh, the same thing happened uh, to a genealogical library in uh, the state capital in Arizona. Uh, there is other, uh, other instances uh, from time to time uh, that the genealogists become aware of, of where the records are either becoming no longer becoming available or they're actually being uh, stored uh, and not and no longer uh, accessible, or they are being destroyed. So all of this. Uh, there's a recent uh, one of the eastern states, I believe it was North Carolina, could have been South Carolina, but one of those states uh, actually destroyed a number of records that were, uh, from genealogical standpoint, uh, very important. Uh, but so the the first step in this preservation process is is making is identifying these records wherever they are wherever they exist, and second one is funding obviously. Uh, once you have identified the records, you uh, there's got to be some source of of uh, resources and funding for the records to to be entered into a, re a preservation process and an archiving process that will maintain the records over a long period of time. And that that part of it is called conservation, preservation, or curation. Um, they're sort of the same things, but they involve different processes. But in the end, what, what they are for the genealogical researcher is that the records are maintained in a format, in a form, and a place where they can be accessed access for research. And then storage. Obviously, if uh, any of you have uh, inherited, like I have, uh, many, many boxes of records for, from your family or your, your larger uh, genealogical family, uh, then storage becomes an issue because you have to have a place where these records can be stored and where they won't be uh, damaged by uh, heat or, or water or some other uh, problem that might occur uh, because of the, uh, the way that the, the documents were stored. And then the last part of it, of course, is cataloging. It, uh, the records need to be cataloged to be accessible. Um, the classic example of this, by the way, is uh, there's two examples that I'll give. One is the National Archives of the United States of America from the Archives uh, uh, and Records Administration. And the National Archives have, uh, they store their records and catalog them by 
linear feet or cubic feet. And so basically all of the agency's records are cataloged in a, in a container that they've measured or multiple containers that they've measured. But as far as the actual contents of those records, what's on those records, there's really no way of knowing that unless you physically go obtain access to the records and sit there and go through the records. Because that's there's just no there's no indexes, there's nothing that tells you if your ancestor's name is recorded someplace or the dates or information about your ancestor is recorded. Now, there are some of the records that have been uh, digitized, but the number of records in the National Archives that have been digitized is extremely small uh, compared to the total number of records. Of course, many of the records that they have, they have uh, stored are not of particular interest to genealogists. and They're not the first place or even uh, well down on the list of places that you would go in order to um, find out information about your ancestral lines. Um, another another example of cataloging is uh, uh, <clears throat> most of the major universities, I would say nearly all the larger universities and colleges in the United States have libraries. And those libraries almost always have what is called a special collections part uh, or division of the library. And the special collections division of a library is uh, the place where they keep manuscripts and valuable uh, anything valuable, any book or, or record of any kind that has some great value, a collector value or whatever. And uh, so these records, they may not have any, any monetary value, but they may have great historical value. And so they're kept in this area of the university called special collections. This is a non-circulation non area. That means that you can't check the, the, any of those items out. They have to be used in the library and they usually have a dedicated reading room uh, where the where any of those documents can be examined, and you have to either gain access to that through a um, some kind of identification registration with the university, and unless you're all you happen to be faculty or student at the university, in which case you uh, you will have access through your your uh, membership in those organizations. But normally the researchers would have to go to these. Uh, special um, collections libraries and uh, register as a researcher and then um, obtain permission to access certain records. The problem with that is that most of these collections are also uh, cataloged, if you will, uh, sort of generally with uh, a name like all of the, uh, the history of the uh, settlements along the Ohio River. Um, that would be a general category, and it might to be described as having information about the original settlers and their families and some diaries and some journals, and it consists of 27 feet, uh, linear feet of documents. Well, okay, so what does that tell you? It tells you as a researcher that you're going to have to go to that, that particular uh, place where the, that collection is kept and examine it and may have to go through it all 27 linear feet to see if it has information about your particular ancestor. So it, there's, a, there's a kind of <clears throat> a lot of different steps here in making these documents into the position where they can actually be um, obtained. Now access is the last one uh, and, and the biggest one because some places there are lots of, of, of uh, record repositories across the United States that have very limited access. Um, it, you can't just walk in and, uh, and ask to see the documents because they'll just look at you and say, who are you and why would we want to show you our documents? And, so, and sometimes it requires that you obtain a prior special permission, pay a fee, uh, become a registered person in order to even get in the door. Uh, much less get access to the documents. And this, is, uh, this can happen uh, around the world. This isn't something unique to the United States. So record preservation, even if we do get the documents saved from the floods and the fires and all the other stuff, uh, may not make the documents accessible. Now, 
today, for example, we have on the online, we have a lot of documents that are digitized and we have more millions and billions of these documents going online every year. And that's becoming a valuable resource for genealogists. Um, my personal observation is that uh, if your ancestors lived most of their lives in the United States or uh, immigrated within the last couple of hundred years, uh, 200 years would be a good, good round number, uh, you can probably find documents to uh, identify the family. Uh, there are exceptions, and there's always somebody who will say, well, my grandfather was adopted, and his parents, and his mother was, uh, and he was born as a, uh, uh, an, to an unwed mother, and uh, so forth and so on. I mean, those are the situations we run into as genealogists, but <clears throat> as a general rule, uh, the vast majority of people who lived on the American continent from 1800 forward to the present have been have some kind of record available for them. Uh, there still isn't resolve every every issue, and you may still have problems uh, doing research. But that makes you know what's what's part of the game here with with doing genealogy. But uh, still, that's still the, the the main issue that we have out there are these uh, access issues. Okay, so as I mentioned a moment ago, maintaining these records costs money. And uh, you have to have somebody who's willing to continue to pay a lot of money to, to support their documents and, and has to have you know, the political clout, if you will, to, to keep the documents from being uh, destroyed on a, an economy move, that it's no longer in the interests of the government to keep those records. Now, a lot of records are destroyed simply by purely political reasons. In other words, we have governments who have uh, not what you would call a, uh, a clean track record, and they simply, when they get into power, uh, have a way of getting rid of the documents that they don't like. Um, we have lots of records that were destroyed during wars because the, the whoever won the war decided that they had to get rid of all of the other records of the person, people who lost the war. So that there's, there's uh, this constant uh, loss. And uh, recognizing that, that records have a value, uh, even if it's a negative value, meaning that this record may not have any value per se as a record, but it does have a value, be a negative value, because somebody has to keep paying to maintain it or to keep it uh, in existence. Now, this is where digitizing comes in. Digitizing saves money on the part of the uh, agency, the government, or the whoever, the re whichever, whatever repository happens to hold those records. It's a lot cheaper uh, from the standpoint of manpower and space and everything else to put your records on hard drives in a, in a server farm than it is to, to have them in uh, climatically controlled uh, storage areas that require uh, cleaning and support and, and electricity and everything else to... Uh, to maintain. So there are some economies here. Uh, in addition to that, the, preser the preservation takes a huge effort. This picture that I'm showing here is a, uh, is a picture of the Internet Archive, or archive.org, which is a uh, big foundation formed for the preservation of documents and has, uh, has done a tremendous effort around the world preserving documents. This shows their uh, book scanning projects. Uh, they have right now on their le website, uh, archive.org, about 11 million books, a little over 11 million books. And those 11 million books and documents, and manuscripts and things, are all in the public domain. Every one of them is free to access, copy, download, and use. And uh, so there's things like this that have happened that uh, have created great, uh, great reservoirs of documents. Um, if we think about it, um, and genealogists who are concerned about the record preservation do, we always we always want to the reference, the ultimate reference is to go back to the fire that destroyed the library at Alexandria, Egypt, back uh, many millennia ago. What they had 
uh, was the giant library that had all of the learning of the old ancient world and it was all destroyed in a huge fire. Well, you know, we can keep talking about that. We can fast forward to the present and, and get upset about uh, the 1890 U.S. federal census records, which uh, uh, commonly is attributed to loss by a fire. Um, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but we'll get to that back to the 1890 census. So there's kind of a dual aspect here. First of all, you have uh, the, the aspect of individual preservation. That means that uh, we have our own documents. They may not have a great interest uh, generally among the genealogical community, but they certainly have a valuable and, and important interest to us as individuals and families. And uh, the tragedy of, of the genealogy community uh, for years has been the fact that um, much of the work of genealogists has been lost simply by the fact that the people who survive them uh, when they die uh, have no appreciation at all for the importance or the value of the records and so they end up in the trash. Um, we all have our stories of documents that were lost. Uh, I have a number of stories of documents that were found and some of them were in uh, in pretty good condition and some of them were in, uh, in rather terrible condition. But we have these, uh, you know, we all are aware uh, if we've been doing genealogy for any period of time, that individual preservation is, is always an issue, that there's always things that get lost. Now, there's kind of an understanding here. Now, let me uh, kind of discuss this issue because there's this kind of general idea that, that historical societies and family history centers and uh, libraries and everything are just anxious to take someone's lifelong pile of records from uh, genealogical research? And the answer is no. There's really no one out there, no organizations, hardly any. There's a, there's a few private people who, have, who are willing to take on uh, individual preservation of collections, but they, they're primarily this whole process is left up to the individual and the individual's family. So this is where it's a good idea to have uh, someone in your family that you uh, you can rely on to help with the preservation. The other side of this dual aspect is institutional archival presentation, preservation, which is uh, money driven, uh, basically uh, based on uh, the interests of the organization uh, that undertakes to store records. Uh, there are some notable uh, losses in the world, and I mentioned one of them, I'll mention another one, and that was the huge fire uh, that destroyed the military personnel records in, Sa in uh, St. Louis. So these are kinds of things that can happen in these institutions, but we're basically in a situation where, uh, as individual genealogists, we need to become proactive and involved in this process. Um, now, to get some information about preservation, when we're talking about what we're going to do with a document. I, I get a lot of questions um, about, uh, well, I have, uh, what do we do to preserve our photographs? What do we do to preserve our books? How do you preserve uh, scrapbooks? What do you do if you have, you know, the world's greatest comic book collection and you want to preserve it? Um, not all of these are, are strictly genealogical issues, but they uh, all involve the same kinds of things that genealogists are concerned with. The, the basis or kind of the clearinghouse for this kind of information is the Library of Congress Preservation Directorate. And this is part of the loc.gov or loc.gov website. Um, it used to have a link on the startup page, but now if you want to find the Preservation Directorate, you would have to put a term, a search term in or you can go directly to uh, loc.gov slash forward slash preservation and that will take you to uh, this preservation section. This has a lot of information not only about institutional preservation but individual preservation. How, how you can, what are the best practices for, uh, for preserving any kind of record, uh, books or manuscripts or letters, scrapbooks, comic books are included actually, and um, photographs, 
and there's extensive uh, ref links and references to uh, to archivists and the websites for preservation across the country. This is this is really the kind of central core of what you of the kinds of things that you would want to to know about and be involved with. So what is it that we need to preserve? What is it that we're concerned about enough that we want to spend some time and effort uh, getting those items preserved for the future and for our own use and for our own self-interest or whatever that may be? First of all, we have paper. Uh, obviously, paper is, comes in a lot of different uh, qualities. There's a lot of quali different quality difference in paper. Um, being from the desert southwest and having spent most of my life in uh, the Salt River Valley, Phoenix, Arizona, and Mesa, and all of the surrounding area, uh, we're pretty um, acutely aware of paper. Now, uh, many places in the, in the United States, they have these local newspapers where they throw your newspaper out on your driveway and it's got a you know, it comes in out once a week or once a month or whatever, and, and it, you throw it out on the driveway. We learned in Phoenix one thing that was very important. If that piece of paper stayed there for more than 24 hours, it was turned yellow and brown because the, the sun and the heat were so intense that that newsprint would simply disintegrate almost, begin almost instantly to disintegrate. And so uh, that was kind of the most uh, constant reminder that paper is is uh, a fairly permanent um, it, we have paper that dates back you know thousands of years but uh, the fact that it's preserved is uh, is based on some very very unique characteristics of the paper as well as uh, the way in which it was preserved uh, most of the paper that's been that's used for uh, records and things in the United States are um, you know can vanish very quickly. One of the things, for example, that we had a lot of in uh, in the early days of uh, business in the United States was people were using um, offset ditto machines that used a, a, a ditto master that uh, picked up ink and, and transferred it to a page. And in addition to that, we had thermographed paper. Uh, and interestingly, my father uh, had uh, a lot of his documents that he had put on this thermographic reproduction paper. And uh, interestingly enough, they're totally unreadable today, and you can't even tell what was on the page. There's just all one solid color, even though it once had writing or typing on it. So, uh, you know, paper is kind of the, uh, the first concern. Well, books are paper. Uh, primarily, they're books, unless you get really old and then they're on... Uh, sheepskin or uh, or any other kinds of substance that they had, papyrus and a bunch of other things. But uh, primarily books are paper, and they are the same thing. And some of the old books that I had from when I was uh, young, uh, I bought paperback books. And uh, now, many, many, many years later, uh, those paperback books are basically just shredding into little pieces of, of uh, paper. The paper is, if you try to turn a page, it just breaks and crumbles and it just disintegrates. So something has to be done in the a positive way to preserve some of those items. Now, other books I have that are, uh, you know, more than 100 years old and they still look like they were brand new. Uh, so it just depends on the quality, of course, of the, of the paper that was used and the bindings. Uh, the old paperback bindings break after a while. Uh, we were on a trip recently with uh, some of my grandchildren and my granddaughters was reading a book and she said was asking if anybody had brought along some uh, some mending tape because uh, her book was falling apart and so there's you know this is this is a common problem now photographs are a completely different uh, issue obviously uh, photographs do not have a very lengthy history uh, the earliest photographs the earliest photographic process uh, go, dates back to about 1838 when they be, when they invented daguerreotypes, and so there's uh, photographs are a, a kind of a class by themselves, and many of us have photographs that we took uh, years ago, and we used uh, 
slide film because at that time we were 35 millimeter slides were the sort of the the way that you did photographs and then when you when you wanted to watch or look at them you projected them with a uh, slide projector um, that were, they were nice to have but uh, in most cases many of the films that were used and many of the processes that were used to develop those slides uh, were not permanent and the dyes that were used have faded and it's not unusual to pull a uh, even even a slide that's been kept in a cool place uh, in total darkness for a number of years find out that the chemical changes in the slide have caused a big yellow cast or green cast or or some other color and in some cases uh, they're no longer uh, no longer possible to see what was in the original photograph uh, the paper photographs are the same problems that paper has that it's a it's not a permanent subject uh, uh, substrate it's not something that uh, is going to last forever and, and uh, some of the other types of photographic uh, media like glass uh, plates and, uh, and the old uh, tin types and, and uh, even daguerreotypes and other color types and other types of photographs each have their uh, their challenges as far as their ability to to uh, survive the time frame the time and uh, natural decomposition of the chemicals that created the photographs. Scrapbooks and albums. Uh, oh, don't get me started on these. Anyway, they're, they're kind of a problem. One of the biggest problems that we found uh, with photographs is that people thought that was a really good idea to use to coat the back of the photograph with some kind of glue and stick them all down in, a, in an album. Of course, that uh, makes life very difficult because the photograph is then essentially ruined and uh, not able to be used. And I've uh, actually had to reproduce these. I've uh, my process is to take a photograph, a high resolution photograph of each album page, and then take a separate scan or or photograph of the. Uh, of the album of the photographs themselves, each individual photograph. So we preserve not only the uh, the photographs but the arrangement and what they are on the page. Uh, newspapers are also uh, very very volatile. Most of the newsprint that was used over the last few hundred years uh, has been uh, very low quality paper, and uh, uh, to preserve some of the newspapers is, has become a, a major major issue. And, uh, fortunately, on the newspaper end, there is uh, there have been huge efforts made over the last few years to digitize uh, large uh, newspaper collections, and there are some huge collections of newspapers out there online. Uh, far from the total number of newspapers that existed, but uh, there are still substantial efforts being made to preserve newspapers. Uh, comic books. Uh, nobody has that very high on their agenda, probably, except the comic book people uh, who look, who want to collect them. But um, they are part of the heritage that we have. And there is other audiovisual move uh, groove media that we're talking about records here, uh, like vinyl records, uh, magnetic tape. Uh, the biggest challenge on some of these items and optical discs and others is the uh, obsolescence of the of, the, of the, the mechanical machines, the recorders and the players for these. Um, one of the biggest uh, problems that we face here in uh, the libraries and have for many years, it's almost starting to disappear, is people who had, had their genealogical information on three and a half inch floppy disks and are now trying to figure out how to get their information off the floppy disk. Now the, the challenge there was multiple. First of all, Finding a uh, finding a machine that would read the operating system that created that sloppy disk was the first challenge, and the second challenge was finding a program which would uh, recognize or open the information that was stored on the disk, and then the third problem was where do you transfer it to, and how much of the information was recoverable. So it's uh, you know there's there's uh, uh, this whole issue of uh, of of uh, Preserving these things are uh, each one have it has its particular um, challenge. 
Now, if you have watched any TV and or you've watched uh, uh, Turner TV or broadcasting or any of these different ones, you'll realize that uh, they periodically tell you how fortunate it is that you can watch this old grade B movie that was uh, resurrected from some can of, of film that was uh, kept in a warehouse someplace and it's the last living copy of the of the of the movie well motion picture film was extremely uh, volatile and could degrade very rapidly chemically if not kept properly and and yes uh, a vast amount of the early uh, motion picture world was uh, and is a loss now the the issue for genealogists is that many of our ancestors, in fact, in my family uh, and my wife's family, uh, there were uh, people at times who owned uh, these little uh, cameras, uh, uh, motion picture cameras, usually 16 millimeter film. And uh, they took pictures and had them developed and they would bring out their motion picture projector once or twice a year and show everybody the old films. Well, then there's also the process of uh, of maintaining, preserving, and transferring those items. That usually ends up being a commercial enterprise where people do that commercially to uh, transfer those. Okay, so important to understand that the Library of Congress on that uh, preservation directorate section that I showed a moment ago has the basic information and simple steps to take for good care, handling, and storage of all of those types of personal records. So they address each one individually and tell you how those records should be preserved. Now, once we have become aware of the need for having these records, we need to begin to the process of, of becoming, of extending our preservation concerns. We need to become proactive, is the operative word here, in the uh, preservation community. Uh, not only should we be aware of documents that are available are to, uh, to us locally, but we should be aware of what efforts are being made to have those records uh, maintained and preserved. So, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, I had an occasion a number of years ago to, to uh, be involved in a, uh, in a funeral and burial at a cemetery. And as a result of going into the cemetery, I saw some records. They had a cabinet with some old records going back into the 1800s. And I said, uh, oh, by the way, has anybody ever digitized these or made them available to, uh, to be preserved? And that question alone started the process of getting those documents preserved. So we really have to be involved in understanding and helping those people to, uh, to become aware of it into the larger community. When we talk about the larger community here, we're talking about our worldwide uh, effort of keeping and preserving and helping to preserve records. Now, what happens when the program was discontinued or some kind of program was discontinued? Well, here's what we're facing today. Uh, I've got a, rank, a, a picture here of uh, some microfilm readers. Uh, some of us who have been doing genealogy for a number of years are, are intimately a, a aware of the uh, of these microfilm machines and how we've used them in the past to view endless rolls of microfilm. Um, I'm going to say past in this tense of like yesterday I sat for four hours staring at microfilm. So this is not like something that's still in the past, it's a very much in the present for some of those of us who uh, do a lot of research. So basically uh, the question is what about microfilm? Well anybody who is even you know vaguely aware of, of record preservation knows that microfilm is on the way out. Um, there is a uh, uh, microfilm was uh, invented uh, around the in the mid to 1930s, uh, mostly in, in by the government for military and intelligence purposes, but was adopted by archives. For, for example, the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, and the uh, Genealogical Society of Utah uh, began record 
preservation in 1938 with microfilm. So what you've got here is uh, a many, many years accumulation, almost 100 years of accumulation of microfilm. And that microfilm collections are on film, and film has to be preserved. And uh, in addition, uh, it requires special equipment to view. Uh, it is necessarily the most, the highest quality uh, of, of images. And uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And so what happens is that you have, uh, you have now got technology that is moving away from microfilm. And one of the microfilm, uh, one of the realities is that, uh, and I did some research recently online to figure out uh, microfilm, and it was, uh, one thing that was very apparent was that the cost of the microfilm was increasing and that uh, availability to microfilm had, had uh, basically focused in on one or two very, you know, suppliers today. So the more the more focused that gets on a few people, the higher the price will be because they have a monopoly on the, on the product. And so what there is today is a vast movement of trying to, to convert the microfilm records, which are, which are a, a huge number. Uh, Family Search, uh, for example, uh, uses the, the number 2.4 million rolls of microfilm that they have stored in a, in a large, uh, tunnel uh, called the Granite Vault, which is in a, a big canyon uh, just southeast of, of Salt Lake City. And uh, so there's this process of digitizing has been going on for some time now, but there are still a lot of microfilm out there. So at the time that they discontinued that process of doing the microfilm, actually FamilySearch no longer is taking microfilm images what they are doing is digitizing the existing microfilm, and they are using uh, digital cameras to capture additional documents around the world. So FamilySearch had accumulated 2.4 million rolls of microfilm. Here's kind of a, this isn't actually the granite vault. This is just a, a picture out of the library, and uh, a library. And uh, I think this is probably one of my pictures. No, it's somebody else's. Somebody, some office with a bunch of microfilm boxes. And so this whole microfilm collection is being digitized. If you go on to familysearch.org, you'll see that the historical record collections, which is the most visible part of the microfilming transfer to digital, and the number of records, as you can see, are in many cases in the millions of records per collection. And these are being added uh, regularly, almost uh, many, many collections being added every week. Um, and uh, and it transferred from the microfilm to uh, the digital format. Now, what happens to the microfilm? Well, over the years, Family Search had developed a huge organization of family history centers around the world. They now have almost 5,000 of these. Uh, locations around the world. And the idea was that you could go to a family history center and request uh, a rental of a microfilm. And the, the microfilm would then be duplicated in Salt Lake and sent out uh, to the family history center where you could then view the microfilm. When you were through viewing the microfilm, the microfilm either stayed in the center or was returned uh, to Salt Lake City. Now, that process changed uh, as they began the digitization process because as the microfilm is digitized, it is removed from the list of microfilms that can be rented. So when you now go to the family search catalog and look for um, a microfilm, if we look for a record in the catalog, it will tell you whether or not it is available on microfilm or whether it's been digitized. Now, the third process there is the process of indexing, where the records are indexed um, and uh, there's an index created electronically that will be able to search those records. So this is kind of the process they're going through. Um, in addition, during this, this, during this time that we're doing, they have 
about 300 volunteer-operated cameras digitizing records worldwide. So uh, they have teams of volunteers who are uh, missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is the uh, organization that the church organization uh, that sponsors Family Surge. And these records are then, uh, these volunteers are missionaries are out there uh, with their cameras digitizing millions of more records every year. These are records that are not hopefully duplicated anyplace else, and so they are uh, adding a greater numbers of records, millions of records every year, in addition to those that are being digitized from the existing microfilm collection. So now what happens in, with others? Well, there are other companies out there, obviously, that are uh, expending great resources in acquiring digitized copies of records. Uh, we have companies, the bigger companies are like Ancestry.com, MyHeritage.com, FindMyPast.com. Uh, uh, there's others that have huge online uh, uh, digitized records collections. And so these large organizations have, uh, have basically um, acquired millions and billions, actually billions of records, billions and billions of records. Um, that are, and are available in various formats online, primarily through their particular website. But, but the issue here is that we really need to expand and magnify this effort. Uh, even though we have companies out there who are, are uh, working with uh, larger collections of records, the reality of it is, is they are, that they're working with larger collections of records. Now, what about the records uh, in your local cemetery or the records in your, uh, you know, your local county records or your local records. Genealogists always like to point out whenever I talk about digitization, there's always someone who says something like, well, you know all the records aren't digitized and you'll still have to go to the courthouse here in whatever county in order to see the records. And my answer is, yeah, well, sure. But what are we going to do about it? Um, are we going to let that condition stand until the courthouse burns down or until we lose the records or until they throw them away or what are we going to do? So the answer is that um, as genealogists, as part of the larger genealogical community, we need to be involved in the process of expanding and magnifying the effort of preserving these records. Um, and so as we become more actively involved, so how do we get actively involved? Well. Here we are. The list of what I said was number one on the list of things that we needed to do was identify these records. So uh, this is kind of the, uh, you know where the records are because you're the genealogist and you've researched or looked at the records. So what are you doing to get to those records preserved and made more generally available to other people who may have as great or, or even greater interest in the records than you do personally? So this is kind of the, um, the, the process. The bottom line here is that we need to become involved in, this in the record preservation process. So how do we do that? Okay. Well, back in 1894, uh, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints formed the Genealogical Society of Utah. And uh, this is that nonprofit organization that I spoke of just a moment ago that is sponsoring the microfilm effort and now the uh, now has changed into and it be, and evolved into family search and the website familysearch.org is the main website for the family search uh, international organization and as i mentioned they began microfilming these records for genealogy back in 1938 and it became family search so the genealogical society of utah became Family Search. Now, this is a blog post that was put out recently by Family Search talking about preserving historical records, lessons of the National Personal Record Center fire. Now, the National Personal Record file started um, back in um, 1973. Uh, and at that time in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, 
the, the, pre, the Personnel Records Center for the United States military, for the Army, and uh, some of the other, not so much of the other branches, but primarily the Army and their historical records, going back to World War I and um, of the personal records of these people were destroyed in that fire. Um, so since I served prior to 1973 in the, uh, in the United States Army, um, it was uh, it's highly likely that my own personnel records were destroyed at the time of uh, that fire. And this was one of the great losses. Uh, and what could have happened? Well, if you want to read the article, this is where you need to read the details of, of how this all happened, because it, it was basically uh, a situation where it wasn't, it wasn't, as you would call, intentional that, uh, that the records were destroyed, but it was certainly not uh, all based on, uh, on purely accidental. It was a, a series of the ways that the records were being maintained and, and stored, and the, the, the carelessness that was, uh, that happened and uh, ended up having all of these extremely valuable records to genealogists destroyed. And of course, to all of those people who are military veterans and trying to get um, their military benefits and things, they're all personnel records were all destroyed. So uh, this is something that, uh, that was a major issue. And uh, if you want to see, this is, I put on the screen uh, the link to that document. But if you look for it under Google search under preserving historical records or lesson on the National Personal Records Center fire, lessons of the National Personnel Records Center fire, uh, or any of those words, you should be able to come up with this article from uh, Family Search that discusses this issue. Now, what's the point? Uh, quoting from the blog post. So I'm going to quote exactly what Family Search had to say here. Family Search said, Family Search, a global charity sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is powered by hundreds of thousands of volunteers on the ground and online. This charity has invested heavily in preserving the genealogically significant historical records of the world and providing improved access to them for more than 100 years. Family Search is in the forefront of efforts to digitize, preserve, and maintain and publish the world's historical and genealogical records online to help individuals worldwide make family history connections and discoveries. It has been heavily involved in record preservation since 1938 when it was known as the Genealogical Society of Utah. Here's the, here's the clincher here, folks. The Family search services are free, and they will remain free. Now, not casting any aspersions whatsoever on any other of the marvelously wonderful uh, record uh, websites that have these huge amounts of records, but they are basically commercial enterprises. And those of you who have been buying things at Sears for your whole life know that commercial enterprises don't last forever. Um, and so basically what you need to understand is that there are, there are all sorts of things that, uh, that can and will occur that could prevent those records or make those records have, be in a precarious position. Family Search, on the other hand, is not a commercial enterprise, and there is no intention of commercializing it, and there will never be, and they are dedicated as, as, as fathers humanly possible to preserving and keeping their records. So states, counties, municipalities, churches, archives, libraries, and museums from small to large often find their preservation budgets to be lean. Uh, that was the monetary issue that I was talking about a moment ago. And how can FamilySearch offer its services for free? FamilySearch's expenses are covered by the goodwill gifts and offerings of those who believe in the importance of family relationships. And so the church is uh, not going to go anywhere, and they're not going to stop preserving records. And uh, so we basically have a, a place to go where we don't, we don't have nearly the concern we might have uh, if, if the records were being maintained somewhere else by 
I won't say it, but governments, for example, who have a tendency to go to war and do things like that. So how can you make a difference? So how does this affect you? What, what can you do? Um, here's what Family Search has asked as suggested. You can make connections with key people. Do you know someone in your network of family, friends, or colleagues who is a custodian of records, birth, marriage, death, court, others, or perhaps who understands how decisions regarding records are made and can influence such decisions? In other words, uh, this is a personal thing where you simply go to the person and uh, ask uh, to have the records done. Now, okay, so I'm going to tell a little story here about this kind of su subject, and I'm not uh, trying to say this is anything unusual, but it's it's uh, the way this kind of this situation gets done. I mentioned a moment ago that I had identified some records in a cemetery. Well, the record was in my hometown of Mesa, Arizona, and it was the Mesa City Cemetery. And the records were being stored in the cemetery building in the cemetery, in a little building in filing cabinets. This is in, uh, you know, this is a building that was completely exposed, uh, no security to speak of except for locking the door at night and leaving it alone. And, um, and those records had been in there and accumulated since the 1800s. And they were detailed burial records. They were the burial, um, the, the um, burial permits, which were permits given by the government to open the open a burial and then or sell a, a, a cemetery plot and then um, close that plot up with the body in it. Okay. And so I notify, I recognized those records. I identified uh, who it would who would be interested. Uh, family Search and Family Search was interested in the records. And so then um, I went to the city of Mesa and uh, I obtained an agreement from Family Search and from the city of Mesa. And of course, it helps you to understand that I'm a, I was an attorney. I was an attorney. I'm a retired attorney and that I knew very well the processes that I had to go through. And I basically went to the, to the city and, asked, and uh, requested permission and submitted the documents and did everything that I could do from my standpoint on uh, how to get those records preserved. Uh, I had even volunteered to, to scan and digitize the records, which I ended up doing, by the way. Um, and this was like uh, six months and a year later, and I still had not gotten permission from the city. I'd finally gotten permission from Family Search, but not from the city. And um, uh, finally, I was telling one of my law partners, I said, uh, you know, I've been doing trying this cemetery project for a while, and, and I've been waiting around for the city to approve it for um, uh, about six or eight months now, and I haven't got any way. I keep calling him a couple every couple of weeks and finding out that there's nothing going on. And he and my partner said, "Well, you're talking about the Mesa City Cemetery?" And I said, "Yes." And he said, "Well, that's where my ancestors are buried." And he said, "You mean they won't let you digitize the records?" And I said, "Well, not until I get permission from the city of Mesa." He said, "Oh, well, I know the mayor. Just a second, I'm going to get him on the line." And he called up the mayor right then, and he said, hey, mayor, uh, why aren't you letting the, the family search digitize the records of your cemetery, my records, my ancestors? Of course, the mayor was a little bit put off because he had no idea that this was even going on. But uh, it was only a matter of about a couple of days later that we had an agreement with uh, the city of Mesa and began the process of digitizing the records. This is the kind of process that we have to go through, folks. I, I mean, this is what we're asking for. If you know somebody and you know how to get the job done, you are a crucial person in this process of preserving records. And, and even if you don't, you might be able to find somebody who is. Okay, next is find local opportunities. So we want to tell Family Search about these genetically significant record collections that need to be digitally preserved. Now the issue here is the size of these collections. It's always been an issue in the past, but Family Search, um, the process that I used was I actually did the digitizing of the records on a, with a camera uh, and a uh, and a flatbed scanner and a computer program that had been developed by Family Search. And so this is possible. It's, it's, it's out there. And we need to start moving in the direction of identifying these records and getting involved and uh, actually 
uh, getting if we get enough if you get a big enough record collection it's very possible that they could assign the volunteers to come and take the pictures but in some cases they're going to have to make other arrangements for getting these records digitized now the interesting thing about that website the the uh, the blog post that I mentioned a moment ago is that it gives specific contact information to family search as to who to go to to get this job done so we're we're sitting here looking at this uh, opportunity here to uh, to work with family search uh, this is all right here it was published online um, uh, you know it's available anybody wants to look at that offer from family search to to uh, become involved in uh, in finding identifying these records now here's what I would suggest happens uh, if, if everybody at once decided they were going to do this I think it would probably not happen but if if you as through the process you need to be preserved uh, have persistence, be persistent in doing this. I What I should have emphasized in my story about the city of Mesa was this whole process took three years. Uh, it wasn't something that I finished in a week or a day or and I had to keep working on it for quite a long period of time. And in addition, you become a record preservation volunteer. Family Verge can, can provide training to local volunteers to help prepare documents to be digitized or operate its digital camera equipment used to digitally preserve and publish historic records online. Okay, here you go. This, by the way, is a quote directly from the Family Search um, post that was online. I'm not making this stuff up. This isn't me talking. This is uh, these these are direct quotes from Family Search. So here's the numbers uh, and. Uh, when I put these things onto a uh, webinar like this, uh, you understand that when you're watching it, come back on the YouTube, when it's on the YouTube channel, you can stop the YouTube channel and look at this and copy it down. You don't have to frantically grab a piece of paper and try to write it down because it, you can go back and find it again. Um, but it's right there on either that blog post. Uh, they have an email address and a toll-free number to call, and uh, they'll get some information out about this. Okay, well... Well, thanks you for watching. I uh, encourage you to become proactively involved in record preservation. And um, this is a webinar sponsored by the BYU or Brigham Young University Family History Library in Provo, Utah. And uh, all of these videos will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And uh, we'll ask you to subscribe to our channel so that you can receive notice of these videos. Thank you again for listening. Okay, well thank you very much James for the wonderful webinar. We hope everyone's been able to learn some new information um, and definitely um, hope you're inspired to do your part to help preserve the records because that's what makes genealogy work possible. Um, so we hope we can see you next time. We will have our next webinar on Thursday. If you have any feedback for us, um, take some time to write that into our feedback box down at the bottom. We always appreciate hearing from you. Um, you can find the link to the recording when it's posted at our website here, or if you go directly to our YouTube channel, um, BYU Family History Library, you can find all of our videos there as well. Um, we thank you for joining us and hope to see you next time.